I'd like to introduce uh, Daniel Sobel. Uh, so speaking of geeking out, uh, when we were planning this first session, I was totally starstruck and totally geeking out because I'm a huge fan of her work, huge fan of her company, and in general, a huge fan of her practice. So those of you who have yet the pleasure to meet Jana, Jana is an expert in the art of improv and has been at this for almost two decades, is been a lead performer and teacher at the Second City in Chicago, uh, where I lived for a few years and attended many of the shows, um, teaches improvisation um, and co-founded the storytelling program that teaches improvisation. And this isn't just for your artsy creative types, your innovators, your people who are probably left on the left side of the political spectrum a little, a little wilder. This is for some serious um, uptight people too. Some people and some some very serious academics and some very serious professionals. So Jana has l designed and led improvisation for the University of Chicago, University of Notre Dame, House of Roll, Allstate, Cardinal Health, LinkedIn, NetSuite, the Chicago Cultural Center, Cook County Public Defenders. And there's like 400 more here that I could read. As I said, this isn't just for the artsy type. So I'm really looking forward to diving in with Jana today to talk about improv, about communication, and how does this apply to improv? So welcome, Jana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paolo. I'm, uh, I would like you to introduce me anytime I walk into a room anywhere in my life. <laughs> I, I uh, you know, I, I don't think I, I don't think I could do this for everyone that, with that sort of enthusiasm, just because, like as I said, I'm really geeking out. Um, oh, even when we were even when we were planning this, I it was know. like, oh, this is so cool. I love that Paolo is interviewing me because he knows a bit about improv, which is super fun for me. It's it's a thing that is um, once you do it. Like I, we're using this word geeking out because that's the way that we've both been sort of talking about it. Um, it's really fun to talk about. So I am so excited to be here today and to get to talk with you guys. I'm so mm -hmm. honored to be invited by the Disruptor League. So thank you guys so much for this. Like I've been looking forward to it for a while. And so it's gonna be really fun. But uh, one of the things that's cool and, and you guys now have this advantage because you just played a little bit um, is that it's, it's as much fun as it is to talk about, it's sort of hard to understand if you've never done it. So I love that you've done it, Paulo, and you already love it. So it should be fun to, to talk about it. I think I'd, uh, I, on that point, I think a number of us have seen Whose Lines It Anyways, yeah. have probably attended a Second City show, maybe watched Second City TV back in the day. Yeah. Um, and we have this intuitive sense of what it is, but maybe you could def define improv for us. Sure, yeah. Well, first, I'm I'm going to make a little correction because there are um, there are a lot of us that perform and teach at the Second City, and there are only like six people at a time that are the main stage performers. And I think you said that I was one of those main stage performers, and so I just want to correct the for the record that that is not so. Um, I have definitely performed at Second City, and there are a bunch of opportunities to do that, but that's just the thing that like. I don't know, we all try to have integrity about that because it's really easy to be like, yeah, I'm one of those six, but no. Um, but yeah, so uh, to talk about improv a little bit. So here's the thing about what it is. Um, it, it, it definitely has been um, used to generate entertainment. Um, probably all of your favorite comedic actors and shows, whether you love uh, Saturday Night Live or 30 Rock or Key and Peel or Portlandia or Parks and Rec or any of these like ensemble based comedy shows, um, as well as the late night shows. Um, uh, all of the late night shows have writers from the Second City. Um, so so uh, all of this training comes from the Second City um, and, and from Chicago style improv. Uh, there are also a lot of amazing improv theaters all over the world and all over the U.S. right now, which is something that makes me really, really happy that it's spreading out so people don't just have to come to Chicago anymore. Um, but Chicago holds an interesting like history piece um, because the birth of, of improv in the United States, as, as we're all kind of familiar with it, um, whether you're watching Whose Line Is It Anyway?, or you're watching any of those favorite, you know, comedic television shows, or um, some people don't know, uh, 
uh, who, uh, what's it called? Um, Curb Your Enthusiasm is mm -hmm. all improvised. That's another place where you can see improv. Um, um, uh, all of Christopher Guest's films, whether it's A Mighty Wind or Best in Show or This is Spinal Tap, those are all improvised as well. Um, and the reason that improv has turned into this like entertainment boon is because it's fun to watch adults make things up on the spot. It's fun to watch adults trust each other and uh, trust themselves. Um, and it's fun to watch people trust the part of their minds that is creative and collaborative. So, so it's joy. The laughter at improv is usually a laughter of delight rather than a laughter of like, oh, that's a hilarious joke. Um, okay, so I'm derailing a little bit, but I'll finish this thought and then I'll stop with this answer. So, so this is why it gets used for entertainment, but really improv was created um, by a social scientist. Um, and it was created in order to help groups of people come together and recover from difficult times through play, not through lecture and PowerPoint and strategy, but through play, through game theory. Um, and so we've kind of come full circle now, like um, a lot of people are waking up and realizing the broader applications of improv, how it is designed to, um, to unite people, to lift people up, to free up people's creative imaginations and to help them collaborate like geniuses together. So maybe we'll talk more about that history piece if you want, but that's, that's a bit about it. So where does the connection between improv uh, innovation, design, disruption, where does that begin? Or what, what is the connection to things that are applicable to the, our worlds? Yeah. So, um, so I sort of stumbled into working with innovators about three or four years ago. Um, and by stumbled, I mean that I had people that were heads of companies and human resources people and innovation leads um, taking my classes and then having conversations with me and asking me about these applications and talking about these applications. And I just got really excited because in addition to this work, making the individual feel freer, um, funnier, more capable of trusting themselves and creating with others, what it really does is it like changes the social dynamics. Um, it changes people's lives uh, through relationship. Um, and it basically creates something that we call the ensemble. Um, so the ensemble is something that um, is born when say, so I stumbled across this study that was conducted by Google a few years ago. And they basically took, um, so funny, I keep forgetting this is an interview and it's fine for me to just ramble. Like, I really <laughs> love talking about all, so just please jump in if I'm. <laughs> um, so there was a study that was done by Google and um, what they were trying to figure out is what made their uh, most innovative teams most innovative. And this is probably something that some of you guys are familiar with, but they, the study was conducted over many, many years, and they were looking at things like demographics, age, educational background, diversity within groups. Um, they were looking at even personality types, like they did the whole like, um, what is that like INFPT thing test. Um, they were analyzing people psychologically and socially and uh, leadership style and education and all of this, and none of these factors mattered whether there was diversity among the groups or whether it was very homogenous, that didn't matter either. Um, and they almost gave up on the study because they couldn't really figure out what it was that made their most creative, productive, joyful, innovative teams that way. Um, and then they finally uh, changed their approach towards the end of the study. Um, and they started paying attention to the dynamics between the people um, and they identified a condition that they call psych safety or psychological safety. Um, and this condition is basically born of two different factors. One is that um, the people in the group um, do something called conversational turn-taking, which we call give and take. And this is something that's been studied and pursued and developed since improv was born in Chicago 100 years ago. 
Um, it basically means that you share space and you are genuinely interested in the contributions of the people that you work with. Um, it means that you are actually curious about them, that you're actually lit up by them and you actually wanna hear them. So you're not dominating all the time like I am doing right now, right? Like, but you're, you're, you're listening, there's a, there's a give and take. Um, I wanna kind of like front load some of this stuff and then we can just dialogue about it. But, um, and then the other piece is, uh, is basically um, when people feel comfortable bringing their humanity to bear it within their, their working groups, they're allowed to be a person um, and they're allowed to uh, show up as human and not have to be in that sort of polished, protected, pretendy uh, work self that we've all been taught to create. Um, yeah. So how does this, I mean, th these sound like great attributes or great qualities. And, you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with that Google yeah. study and, yeah. um, question is then you know how does the practice of innovation that has become the foundation of so many of those really awesome sh tv shows mm -hmm. uh, how does that bear out in in, in creating yes. this psychological safety and shared space yes so so this is sort of what it comes down to it it has to do with the history piece so improv was created um not for entertainment but to uh help people establish these dynamics, basically. What we've now 100 years identified as psychological safety is what Neva Boyd was working on with people at the end of the Great Depression in Chicago uh, 100 years ago. So her goals were, she was given these goals by the, the it was through the Works Progress Administration that this woman was given this job. Um, and they basically said, we want you to do three things with what is basically a fragmented and traumatized population. So at this time in Chicago, it was after World War I. So people's lives had been lost. People were injured uh, from the war. It was towards the end of the Great Depression, um, which is a trauma the likes of which even now we can't really imagine. And also there were a lot of people living in the city that were from different countries. There was a lot of recent immigration and people spoke different languages and they were pretty separated from each other, feeling very isolated and fragmented. Maybe like a lot of us are in the United States feeling right now in particular um, politically. And, and her job was to, uh, to do three things. First of all, um, to help people recover from trauma collectively um, to help people feel uh, united and invested and like they belonged to each other, to feel that's the ensemble, um, and to recover their personal creativity, their personal genius. So that's what the work was made for. It ended up being used for comedy and entertainment later on, but that's what it's built for. So. So she did this work through the Chicago Parks District and it worked. Basically her job was to um, unite and rehabilitate a city that was on its knees and give people back the power to rebuild the world after the Great Depression. And it spread fast and the games worked really well and it fostered this sort of weird uh, sense of investment and community and solidarity that you feel when you come to Chicago. Uh, uh, a question from Jason, what was her name again? Her name was Neva Boyd. Um, it's a bit of lost history. People are starting to do all of their like um, master's thesis on her now, finally, which is great. Um, but then there's a, a little bit of a stepping stone. So then um, a, a few decades later, so she had an apprentice. The apprentice's name was Viola Spolin. And Viola Spolin was a Chicago public school teacher, an activist, a grassroots a activist. She worked through the Jane Addams Hull House. Um, and she was a public school teacher. And a couple decades later, she had uh, noticed along with her other fellow teachers that at the end of World War II, um, a bunch of kids came flooding back into the Chicago public school system. Um, and the reason for this was that they, uh, a, a, a child labor law changed basically. Um, so while the adults were away fighting the war, these kids had been working in factories. When the war was over, the labor law changed, the kids came back to school. And this woman, Viola Spolin, who had been Boyd's apprentice uh, decades ago, noticed that these little kids couldn't play. 
that like on their breaks from class, they would just sit and wait, like, where's my machine? Um, which is natural. They had had their little spirits kind of broken by working in factories 12, 14 hours a day. Um, they also had a real hard time with team sports um, and they had a really hard time with art, um, being creative. And so there was this uh, idea that she had, what if I took these games and I adapted them to rehabilitate these children so that they could regain their ability to be playful and collaborative and creative. And so she did that um, and her son, Paul Sills founded the Second City using her games. So all that we teach at the Second City is not how to make jokes. We don't teach that at all, actually, unless you take a stand-up class. Um, but the improv training is actually like rehabilitation work for children. <laughs> so um, it's, it's actually teaching these skill sets. It's about teaching people to listen better, to be more generous, more empathetic, more attentive, more creative, and more collaborative. And that's where the long answer to your question comes in, uh, Paolo, is that it connects to innovation because that's what we're trying to do right now with innovation. So many companies are trying to break old forms. They're trying to break oppressive forms, to be honest. They're trying to break exploitative forms. They're trying to figure out like, how do we give power back to individuals? How do we trust the humanity of the individuals that work for us? How do we value their intelligence? How do we uh, uh, benefit from their intelligence and how do we help them like multiply their powers by working together? So my stumbling into these innovation spaces and getting to work with Notre Dame and the University of Chicago and on these many companies has been nothing but a joy. It's just been this like incredible pleasure because it's a, it's a kind of homecoming and I'm not the only person doing that right now. A lot of uh, companies are waking up and going, oh, these tools exist. They were built, they were made for us 100 years ago. We, we need these things that help us listen better when we're, when we're in the discovery phase. We need these tools that help us collaborate better when we're in the brainstorming phase. We need these tools that help us create better when we're in the innovation phase. So this is, this is why they fit. Long answer. That's one, That's one thing cool. that really stands out to me is you were describing these um, post-war uh, post children or coming out of the, you know, who, who are returning to school and not learning how to play. I can't help but seeing the analogy between that and executives. Yeah. Who, you know, there, there, there is a, uh, you know, as a, as an, a former artist myself, visual artist, one of the things I, I became keenly aware of is people start, don't, you know, it's not that people are natural at drawing or doing art. It's a not, it's that they actually unlearn over time. And yeah. it seems like similarly, uh, a lot of sort of smart and even at one time creative executives unlearn how to be creative and have the similar go through a similar experience that you're describing for uh, yeah. for uh, for these children. I agree so much with that. Yeah, I feel like it's almost a hazing process that people go through in business school and in business in in learning to sort of like turn off the very parts of ourselves that that we need in uh, once we get there <laughs> like it's it's yeah so it's it, so this work then becomes about sort of like reclaiming what you already are or what got sort of shut out the door left behind um and bringing it bringing it to bear in the moments where we need it now as we're oh. like reimagining the world yeah so what does this look like you know these are these these are pretty high claims these are pretty i mean they're founded in some pretty serious <laughs> well these are some you know but they're, they're founded during um you know for a practice that most of us associate with creativity and humor and entertainment yeah. you know you're painting you're painting a, a picture of healing uh social you know addressing social unrest and strife dealing with um emotional trauma, all these really heavy things. Um, how, how does this actually work? It sounds really unpleasant, actually, <laughs> when, we, yeah, when we frame it that way. So, so I think the main thing is that it goes back to that original directive that, that 
that was given when the work was created is that all of these tall orders that are in front of us right now, like again, a hundred years later, um, had to be addressed through play, not through therapy, not through, you know, stressful discussions, um, not through like, you know, again, a PowerPoint, right? <laughs> but how can we rediscover the value of trust through play, not by talking about the value of trust? Um, how can we discover the value of listening and curiosity through games rather than talking about the value of listening? Um, so it's fun. So what it ends up looking like is like, and this is the, probably the trickiest part for me uh, as a facilitator of this work and as an ambassador of this work, trying to introduce it into corporate contexts, is that it looks like play. Like, mm -hmm. You play. You get together and you have like, you know, however long you can do the tiny little morsels of this or you can do a full um, arc of games. It depends on how much you want people to learn. Like if you really want people to have a transformative experience, you do two and a half hours. Right. Um, if you want to have like little glimpses of it, you do a bit here and there and then people are left sort of dazzled and bewildered and it's over. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the way that it looks, Paulo, is, is um, it is really similar to like the classes that you've taken. Like we bring mm -hmm. that into a corporate context and people play and the time fall lies and you're laughing the whole time and then it's over. <laughs> and, and, um, and you do this thing that call, it's called play and then post. So that means that uh, the posting is the way that you, so the games are built to, to give you discoveries. So the games right. are, you're laughing and having fun, but what you're actually doing is learning things. Um, and so then you pause between games and you do this post game analysis, right? Which is to say, okay, you guys, so what was that like for you? What did you notice? What made it more fun? What made it less fun? Um, there's this really simple game that's like a version of a pass the clap game. And uh, this is a game that I always play with executives. Uh, for those who, who aren't familiar with Pass the Clap, we're not talking about um, STIs. <laughs> Just putting that, putting that out there for the world. Oh my God, I forgot about that. Yeah, I usually notice that when I'm in a room full of people because people start to look really <laughs> like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, no, it's not that. Um, but it's a very simple game. And what it does is it like really quickly exposes um, the tendency to dominate and to put others down. Mm -hmm. um, and it shows people that have those tendencies that that doesn't work in the game, right? I don't have to tell them it doesn't work in life. I'll just, you know, we discover that that doesn't work in this game because the game literally breaks. The game stops working if you try to exploit each other or embarrass each other. Um, and so we talk about that as we play and you know, they'll try to do it to each other because there's a tendency there to be dominant. Um, but then we realize that doesn't serve us. And so really quickly, people just drop that. And then they discover how much fun it is to take care of each other, to ensure each other's success and, and to realize that other people's success gives them joy. So I don't have to tell them that. They learn that. And then I'll pause and ask, so what did you notice? What worked, what didn't work? What made it more fun? What made it less fun? And then they will say that. They're the ones that say, you know, it didn't work when I did this. Uh, mm. It worked a lot better when I did that. And then you can say, I wonder if there are any other applications for that. And people will start to think, oh yeah, this, this could, I, could I bring this into my working relationships? So that's one little example, um, but that's it. You play and then post, and it's just a journey of games and reflection on games. What are some of the other uh, behaviors or uh, attributes or qualities that people are surprised by that brings out what you know that, that these activities take, tend to bring out or highlight yeah um something that people pretty frequently discover about themselves is their own internal critic that comes to the forefront pretty fast um people start to notice this like internalized voice that um makes them afraid to try things and mm -hmm. makes them dislike and dismiss their own ideas um people become acquainted with their fear um, and then they, they have these safe containers that allow them to explore stepping past their fear. Um, another discovery that's made really commonly is like what it feels like to be supported by a group. Um, mm -hmm. All of 
all of the yes and work is a chance to say, again, you don't have to do this in your life. <laughs> you never have to do this anywhere else, but just for right now, let's try this. Let's try this yes and thing and just notice what it gives you. You can take it or leave it, but see what comes up. And people's discoveries through yes and is like, oh my God, it was so much fun to create together. <laughs> Like, and I had these ideas I would never have had before. And we came up with ideas together that we would never have come up with if we were blocking everything. Blocking basically means that you shoot each other's ideas down. Um, uh, I would say that the ensemble is a big discovery. Um, uh, I find that there's a really a sh a effective shift that happens when people move from being competitive towards each other to being competitive towards competitors. <laughs> so that like your team is your team. Um, and the, the idea that like competition within a company is healthy, sure, you know, to some extent there are like rewards and, you know, progresses and advancements and everything. But the most important thing I believe is to treat each other like your team. It's like when a basketball player goes up to make a shot and then, you know, misses, you don't see his teammates be like, whatever, man, like, we're going to freeze you out for the next, no, they surround him, you know, and there are those beautiful little memes where you've got like one teammate, like touching this guy's heart and then like bringing his chin up, you know, or like patting each other on the back. There's, there's camaraderie and uh, team teamwork that, is, that benefits uh, a group of people working together. So that's another big discovery that people generally make. Um, so yeah. how would you suggest teams who are, you know, toying with this idea, bring this in? Like, I mean, the obvious answer is hire, you know, bring in an expert to do a workshop or go to the second city or, you know, go to expert. But is there any way to kind of tiptoe into this or try or make it an easy thing to, to get into? Yeah, I, there are a couple of different ways to do it. You can learn to facilitate it okay. yourself or you can bring in a facilitator. Those are really the two ways um, because there's nothing to be gained by just talking about it, right? You can't sit down with your team and be like, let's talk about improv. <laughs> you have to play. So you either need to uh, bring somebody in who is good at facilitating this process for people mm -hmm. or you need to get good at facilitating this process for people. Um, and either way can work. Uh, but it, it is, um, you know, there, there are different aspects of it. You want to know how to stack the games so that they give people a learning arc. A lot of the time, Paula, you and I have talked about this. Uh, people go in and they do improv for corporations and they just bring a bunch of warm up games. Like this is happening a lot. People mm -hmm. like zip zaps off, you know, <laughs> and that's, that's fine, you know, and, and that's the fault of the purveyor. That's the fault of the, um, you know, the, the, the organization that's providing the improv, they'll be like, let's just bring them a bunch of fun improv games. It's a team building experience. It's an ice breaking experience. It can be those things too, but that's also kind of embarrassing. Like, you know, people show up for these trainings and then they're just like, okay, I'm a duck, you know, and then it's over and they feel sort of exploited and embarrassed by being made to like jump through these hoops and play all these dumb games. Well, you know, that's the wrong way <laughs> to use yeah. improvisation uh, to help a company with innovation. To help with innovation, you want to strategically apply improvisation. And that means you identify, yes, Cody Wales, um, <laughs> you, like identify um, what your goals are. So like, if you have a group of people that are entering like, you know, an, uh, a discovery period and you want to really, really learn about your client, then you probably want to grow your listening skills and your curiosity uh, and your collaboration. And so then you, you tell the improv purveyor and they design a series of games that are designed to do that. So it's an arc uh, that lets you have a series of discoveries. Um, you know, if you're getting ready for like uh, an ideation period, you want, might want to work on uh, right brain play. This is freeing up your own creativity and yes and which is collaborating with other people in a really like free right brain place um if you're at a point where you're going to be pitching then you might want to you know bring somebody in that helps you get really comfortable and capable expressing yourself and communicating your ideas so 
So I guess that's the first thing, like make sure that it's strategically applied, bring in someone that knows how to facilitate or learn how to facilitate it yourself so that you're not just like, if we play zip, zap, zap, you know, all these miracles are going to happen. It's, it's like a little bit more strategic than that. Um, it, it was interesting. Uh, we were, uh, Jen and I were talking about a potential design course, a design innovation uh, uh, that follow a, a pretty traditional design thinking uh, framework and methodology. And we were trying to say, well, where does improv fit in here? And it was almost every session along the way where there was a unique facet of where improv could um, enhance, could bring a new side, um, can really deepen the practice, whether it was, you know, the, being empathetic with users, generating new solutions, problem framing, storytelling, all of these skill, kill, uh, key skill sets were just amplified. Um, it was just unfortunate the scheduling didn't work out, but it would have been, yeah. it'd been amazing. Yeah, well, we'll do it at some point. We we're, will. We're, we're going to be putting together classes and workshops through the Disruptor League, so there will be some offering that we will be doing together at some point in the future. We just don't know the dates yet. So with that, maybe you could tell us a little bit about, so, you know, we are uh, talking about what, you know, what kind of courses we can offer through the Disruptor League, but maybe you could just kind of give a high level about what some of those courses you teach are and what is the learning outcomes objectives? Just, and I don't mean this as a sales pitch, we don't have them scheduled, but what is the type of thing that you would be teaching? Well, we don't have anything scheduled, so I don't actually know. And and that's actually um, that's that's actually the truest answer is that like it, we it, it will just depend on what we want, right? So okay. like if if you want to have a workshop that is about liberating the creative imagination, that's right brain play. Um, if you want to have a workshop that is geared towards a discovery process and working with the client, that would be empathy and listening. Um, if you want to have a workshop that's geared towards uh, ideation, that would be yes and, uh, and ensemble. Um, ensemble is a really big um, uh, part of that, of that learning process. Um, and then just as you said, if you want to have a workshop that's about that, that benefits you in pitching, then it's, it's, a, it's a workshop that helps with communication and relax self-confidence and, and knowing what you wanna say. Um, yeah, which is, uh, which is also storytelling work. So that's, that's an, the other um, discipline that I pull from is storytelling. Awesome. Um, we're going to set, we'll send out a survey afterwards to see if anybody is interested um, and, and what you might be interested in. And if you, if, you know, if in a course for the future, um, because we want to build it in conjunction with our members. Yeah. Um, I want to open up the, I want to open this up to uh, the participants to, you know, get their time to, to chat with you. But before I do, there's one question that's really burning and <laughs> maybe I should, I don't know if this is the right time to do ask it. it, but you know, you talk about um, improv in the history of it is about bringing healing. Um, what would improv, if you know, what would um, Neva Boyd or Viola Spolin, um, what would they do now? Or what would, you know, or what would Janice Sobel recommend to the US who's needs some healing right now? Yeah. And what would that improv, what, what, what could improv bring to the world? Well, so, I, I, it will sound probably a little re bit repetitive, so I won't repeat too much, but it's just to say that like the things that I think that we need right now, um, which, which do have to do with like getting our joy back during a time of uh, a lot of pain and stress and that do have to do with feeling connected while we are all very isolated and far away from each other. Um, and that have to do with like creating and, and being free enough in our minds to be able to think outside of the boxes we've built to rebuild the world in a new way that all of those things are very relevant right now. And that that's you know why I talk about how the work was created is because there's quite a parallel. Um, uh, I used to tell my classes that um, at the beginning of any like level A class that anybody took with me, I gave them that little piece of history um, and now it feels different when I give them that piece of history because, you know, 
we're we're living through a time that has its own similar challenges. So yeah, I mean my in my I can't speak for either of those amazing women, but I will just say that in in my opinion that that's what I think people need right now is to understand um well, first of all to have a chance to like breathe and play and move. Um a lot of us are really stagnant and isolated right now, sitting in front of two-dimensional screens all the time. Um, and to start laughing again and to start listening to each other, even through this weird little two-dimensional interface, um, mm -hmm. to start creating together and uh, realizing how very connected we can be in this time for a while, while this is the way things are. Um, and and to, to actually use the opportunity of the time to kind of rehabilitate our personal creativity and, and our communities, to create unity in people that are far away and to help us create together again. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jenna. Um, I think that's that's some sage advice. I think that whether it's for healing the the, the world, the U.S., or even our own working, um, even our own uh, environments, I think this is that's a super applicable. Um, with that, uh, let's open it up um, to our to our members and to our team here. Um, you know, if you guys can unmute or Max, if you could help unmute anyone who uh, who would like to open up some questions for Jenna. I'm happy to, to, to monopolize the time. I've got like a thousand more questions. I wasn't joking about geeking out, so. Paolo, it, hi, Jana, it, it's Vicki here. I couldn't help but uh, as I was listening to you describe improv and the history, it was making me think of a, of a team that I served on, a product development team at an advertising agency uh, several years back. And one of the creative leads on that team was so, uh, his presence was so desired by many of our clients. And one of the things I was thinking of as you were talking is that the owners of that company gave him freedom to be himself. And I wouldn't, I'm not sure at the time I would have thought to label what he was doing as improv, but he showed up every day at work not necessarily physically as dressed as somebody else, but you just never knew who he was going to be. <laughs> and I remember going out on a hmm. pitch for a big piece of business with some uh, ag, with an ag chemical client. <laughs> so it wasn't like a real sexy kind of piece of business that we were pitching <laughs> to get. And we were having uh, cocktails at an Irish pub the evening before the pitch and some of our clients were there and a bunch of our team members were there and and this I, I'll leave the names out but this guy knew that I had Connemara ponies that are from Ireland and so he comes over to me and he goes Vicky and he's already speaking in an Irish accent in that moment oh. Vicky let's you and I be a couple and we're going to be visitors from Ireland and let's go sit in that booth over there with those people and we'll find, we'll, let's just have a chat, you know? And so that was very unlike me in that moment, but he was so persuasive <laughs> about things. I went with him and off we went to have this chat as if we were two people from Ireland. He's asking me questions about the ponies. Some of our colleagues on our team were astute enough to sort of pick up on all of this. They pick up the tab for this family that we sat down with to chat. And those people weren't at all related to our business pitch or anything. They were just like random subjects that my friend picked out to go, to go have a conversation with. That was significant in that company deciding to send the business our company's way wow. because they're just so like wildly amused yeah. by my teammate and yeah. that he just is having fun all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's so lovely. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I um, I resonate with that a lot. I feel like, I mean, before I just sort of piggyback off of that and s tell you what my impression is, do you have any like, uh, are there any things that you're that you that you are at, that you want to ask me around this, or just want to kind of share and connect over that story? Well, if I think of something related to that story is yeah. if you have advice you can give us on if we're the team leader yeah. how do we stop ourselves from stifling that person 
Yeah, okay, that's such a beautiful question. So this, this goes back to like fifth grade for most of us. Um, um, there's a thing that happens to people around that age where we learn to put on um, what I call the neutral mask. Um, and the socialization that takes place between like the, it's complete by eighth grade. So it's like fifth to eighth grade. Um, and it's where we learn um, to be cool, essentially. We have a lot of external pressure to be cool. We have it from parents. Uh, we have it from teachers. We have it from social groups. It comes in different forms. Um, we learn, you know, not to cry and have feelings at that age. We learn not to be goofballs and bounce off the wall. Um, that gentleman that you're describing is, I would bet money, a kid that got in trouble quite a lot when he was in middle school. Um, because, you know, my mom was a public school teacher her whole life. Um, and she always said the public education system um, is designed to create compliant workers. Um, that's what it was designed for, actually. It wasn't really designed to like give fruition to all of us, to like nurture and bloom all of our unique, wild, creative, you know, aptitudes that we're in such need of right now. It, they, it was meant to make us compliant and, and business in the United States um, it also reinforces that. It reinforces compliance and putting yourself into a narrow, rigid box. So the fact that this gentleman was able to, um, um, what's the word, like protect and preserve this part of himself was not an accident I would venture without knowing him. Um, it is like heartbreaking work to keep that part of yourself alive when, uh, this sounds like a very sad thing to say, but when, when everyone else around you is shutting down, it's kind of a lonely business probably for him. He may also find enough joy in that uh, that he can also spread it to other people and then people come awake with him and he's not alone anymore. But there are leverages that keep us subdued and sedate and compliant. Um, if you were to see me in a room full of, you know, business people networking, I would probably be subdued and sedate and compliant um, because it's embarrassing to be like that unless you have a tremendous amount of courage. Um, I have these contexts where it's safe for me to be more truly myself, to be expressive and funny and to laugh and, and you know, to, to mess up and try again and to be imperfect and to be loving and generous. And so I really think that's the, the key is that he, it sounds to me like he's a person that not only survived with that part of himself intact, and that was probably a fancy business of keeping that alive his whole life long, um, Perhaps he had creative communities, perhaps he had an amazing family, perhaps he had an amazing like writing group, or maybe he took improv classes, but he had something that was like a, a place that allowed him, I would venture to say probably had something that, that supported that part of him. And then he also created it for you guys. It sounds like he, he found a space that was his to say like, okay, I'm gonna make this a space where it's safe to be big it's safe to be creative, it's safe to be playful and jokey. Um, it's still a risky business to be like that inside of business. And I'm always like really honest with people about that in business contexts. Um, anyway, yeah, uh, that's just some thoughts. Thank you so much for sharing that story. Thanks, Vicki. Um, we only have five minutes, oh, we only have seven minutes left and I wanna, uh, open up to make sure that, you know, there's a chance for other people um, who, uh, who might have some questions, who might want to bring improv or some of these principles into their own practices or into their own workspace. All right, Jason, I see your hands up. Yeah, so just, uh, I guess, a quick question about Second City, Dan. First of all, thank you. The history is fascinating. I knew, obviously, Chicago was kind of the epicenter. I had no idea about that, that history, so that, that's awesome. So thank you for sharing that. But I guess I'm next door here in, in Northwest Indiana. So what is the current state of Second City? Obviously a, a theater is, is not a business that's thriving at the moment, <laughs> unfortunately, is at least in person. Between Second City, I've done some work with Second City Works in the past. So I guess between the various arms, what, what it, you know, yeah, uh, how do folks get engaged with Second City? 
Yeah, it's still happening. And I, I am definitely not a representative of them. I am yeah. not here today on behalf of Second City. I'm just me. I work independently uh, as a facilitator and a teacher in my own private practice. I also teach for them. Right. Um, and so that's the only way that I can sort of speak to their circumstance. Um, I, I'm not qualified to say what the state of their business is, right? Fair enough. Yeah. But I will just say that our, our classes are online. Um, yeah. And that for every single one of us that works as a teacher, a facilitator, a performer, it's hard to not be together. Like it's- yeah. all right, cool. It's yeah, and thanks for clarifying your role yeah. with them as well. Appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the building is dark and we all miss each other. Yeah. And, uh, but we are all teaching, the classes are still running and we're teaching online. And that is more fun than I would ever have imagined. It's like we, it, we had about a two week period after the lockdown where all of these teachers were online with each other from all over from the, there was second at city, LA, Toronto and Chicago. And we were online together every day, basically rebuilding how this work is taught through, uh, through this medium. Um, and we figured out a lot and it, for a while there, it was like, this isn't possible. This work is like so much about personal connection and eye contact and listening and breathing. And how are we going to do this through screens? And we can, and we do. And it's, um, also, I think really helping people to feel connected in, you know, isolating time. So, yeah. Thanks. Do you, Jenna, do you guys offer, um, offer, uh, courses or programs for children? Uh, Second City definitely offers courses and programs have, for children. Ha, yeah, have you ever taught for children? Because like you talk about this, um, uh, you, you know, at the grade five, you, you start to unlearn these things. And, and I think about my, my son and I'm like, oh, geez, I think like, I don't, you know, I want to give him the, 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 the tools or the confidence. And I think that'd be something so cool if we could offer children in general, yeah. the, you know, the defense against losing that curiosity and that, yeah. that playfulness. Yeah, so the work was like made for children. L the Viola Spolin's work was for, for kids. Um, I taught improv to children for 10 years um, before I taught adults. And mm -hmm. that's where my like kind of relationship to that subject comes. Um, yeah, and it is exactly what you say, Paolo. For me, that work with young people is about making it so that they don't have to do recovery work as adults. Like if you work with kids from that age, if you're giving them improv, basically, like as they're growing up through that, I mean, I, I do uh, teach improv K through 12 before I started working with adults. Um, so it's applicable all across every age range, but especially in that like fifth grade to eighth grade, you're kind of fighting for their souls. <laughs> like you're trying to like protect and preserve uh, to keep the access open to what Martha Graham describes as this life force, this energy, this quickening, this unique creative energy that is unique inside of all of us. And that um, our only job that she says is to keep the access open. So for me, that was the goal is to keep the access open so that it's not about recovering access later when you're 27 or whatever. Um, and so it's super fun to do with kids. Yeah. And, and Second City does offer improv classes. A lot of the uh, online improv uh, theaters offer improv classes for kids in person and online. All right. Wonderful. Well, I think we're at about time. If there's no other questions, um, we're going to follow up. We're going to, um, you know, we'll, we, we want to be working with you again, uh, uh, Jana, and we hope uh, some of our members will jump on board the opportunity. Um, until then, thank you so much. This has been amazing. I'm, again, starstruck and love the, the opportunity to learn about the history and about why improv is the way it is and how it applies to our world. So Pretty thank cool. you so much. Can I sneak one last question in that will take us over, Tom? Sorry. Okay. Uh, so I think... I this, this answer is going to drag us over two o'clock, so forgive me, everyone, know. on the call. If you um, go, farewell, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to stay. Uh, so, so you're talking about this, uh, you're talking about the, the balance routine moving from just the, like the really baseline exercises and icebreakers to a more strategic look at um, using it in a business context. Yeah. Um, but how do you move from, or how have you seen people move in, in an organization that's more conservative mm -hmm. uh, that from like prescribing uh, 
innovation and play as a thing. And it ends up being just this like, oh, we're going to be, we're doing innovation and we're doing play and we're doing improv. And it's like, it's just a prescription and to say that we're doing it and it's a checkbox and the, it, the culture never changes, but you know, these exercises that you can do. Uh, Cody, I'm going to do my best to answer this right now, but I would love to have a long conversation with you about this because I totally see this. I, I just see it happening so much. And I, I'm sort of addicted to this question right now because it is, it, it's one of those things that's being used as sort of like a panacea. It's like, um, oh, it, like the buzzword is improv or the buzzword is innovation. So let's just do a bunch of these activities and then we'll like check that off the list and nothing ever changes. So these big like institutional changes, like how to implement institutional change. Um, you know, I will say that uh, the, the, the people that I've seen well, I imagine that to the best of my understanding, this is something that probably the, the Disruptor League is thinking about a lot in the way that they design the programs that they're trying to design. Like they're, they're, they're drawing on experts. They're, they're working with a bunch of us to say like, how do we actually like, change a culture to become more innovative? Like what are the steps for implementation? What are the actual practical steps that you have to go through? And, and I'll, I'll, after I finish this long-winded sentence, I'll ask Paula to talk more about that. Cause I think that, you know, they're doing a lot of good work on that. Um, you know, the, the Innovation Academy at the University of Notre Dame is thinking a lot about that. There's a book by Nancy Tennant called The Innovation Universe that I would highly recommend. Nancy is kind of a living genius and her address is to this question of like how you actually, actually help the culture change to become more innovative. So there are like big long answers to that question. I think a bunch of people working on that problem. But I would say that like the very first thing and the smallest thing that I can say in, in the short time that we have is to not check boxes, like to ask yourself, why are we promoting innovation? Why are we promoting impro improvisation? What is the real why? If it is to check a box, then it isn't gonna work anyway. Like if the real why is because you actually wanna give agency back to people, you actually want to like spark a community that is more equanimical um, that is more generous and more inclusive and more uplifting of each other, then the application of these tools will be much more like available to you guys and much more effective. But, but I totally agree with you that if it's that mentality of like, check a box, do improv, do innovation, it's n nothing is going to change. You'll have sort of these obnoxious professional development seminars that you know, like people might have a couple fun moments and then it's over and, and then everything goes back to being the same. Um, so I do think it's about asking leadership, asking themselves the deeper questions of why do we even want to do this? Is it just for profits? Like, are we just using innovation as a synonym for make new stuff and sell new stuff? Or are we actually trying to meet the needs of a changing world? Because if it's the latter, then innovation is actually can serve human evolution, like at its highest form. Innovation is about being oriented to the customer, the client, the other, and going, we have power and we have money and we have resources. How can we serve you? Like, how can we better humankind? And that question really needs to be asked right now, I think. Um, so it, I think it's the questions we asked ourselves. Why do we want to change? Why do we want to do this? And getting clear on those answers helps the work to serve you better. Does this make sense? I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Well, Jen, I think given uh, given that this is the, the subject of countless uh, thought leaders' dissertations and you know the thought leadership of many around the world, I think you did a pretty good job answering that in a couple minutes. In a minute. Or less. Uh, Cody, I think um, Cody. I think Jenna touched on already. This is this is you know part of the raison d'être for the Disruptor League is to give supports methods approach um, and help build the confidence of people who are looking to change culture of their work. And so the for all of the Disruptor Studio sessions 
all of the programming we will have, as well as all of the community building efforts are geared towards this. And so not to skirt the issue because there is just, it's, it's a much, much longer conversation and over many conversations, um, know that this is what we're going to, our goal is to build towards. If you have any particular burning topics or areas you'd like us to explore, you know, we're looking for specific topics for our meetups, which Max runs. We will be having a number of other thought leader sessions coming up, as well as what we're going to be calling soon Disruptor Studio sessions, where um, we're going to have much more uh, guided sessions, learning and techniques. So all of these are geared at helping people like yourself usher change in their work environment. Fire, fire me an email, paulo at disruptorleague.com, and you know we can find the time to chat. Or if you have any thoughts, feel free. And that goes to everybody. I'll, uh, I'll put my email in the chat. And if you guys have thoughts for future sessions or people you would like to learn from or topics you'd like us to cover, uh, feel free to to uh, put it out there for our group and uh, we'll do our best. I also just uh, gave you guys contact information. If you have more questions or want to reach me in any way, I just put in my email address and website. All right. With that, thank you, everyone. This has been an amazing session. Thank you, Jenna. Um, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for the honor. And it's so nice to be with all of you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye now.